Now let's delve into a very specific topic, which is the illicit trade in cultural heritage. We remember different threats to cultural heritage that can become a risk from general security management, fire, flood, theft, etc., to violence, terrorism, armed conflict. And what we can state is that the more insecure, the more instable the general situation is, the more likely it is the cultural heritage gets damaged or destroyed. And the more likely it is the cultural heritage is stolen, is looted, and then lands in some illicit trafficking scheme and is shipped around the world. We'll have a closer look at that. And we also remember the red lists prepared by ICOM um, concerning certain objects, types of cultural heritage from individual countries that are at risk from being illicitly trafficked, for example, and also which criteria make cultural heritage important. And there we had this yellow box um, referring to monetary value, theft, illicit trafficking, and looting. And when we talk about illicit trade in cultural heritage, there's kind of a trias, three pieces of goods, so to say, that you find online when you check for uh, organized criminality, for illicit trade, and it's usually drugs, weapons, and cultural heritage. And we definitely should refrain from calling cultural heritage a good or talking about cultural heritage goods because they are not meant for uh, trade. They are not meant to be bought. Um, they are not meant to be trafficked. But it's those three things, drugs, weapons, cultural heritage, that are the big three is connected to organized criminality. And there are no absolute numbers. If you check online, you find a huge range of absolute numbers um, when it comes to those three. It also always differs which one is listed first. Is it weapons? Is it drugs? Is it cultural heritage? But it doesn't matter for us. Important is that illicit trading cultural heritage is a very big topic in the 21st century. And we're talking here about illicit trade of paintings, sculptures, graphics, artistic craft, numismatic items, library materials, archaeological items, many of them illicitly excavated, which pose a huge problem, religious items, paleontological items. And we have great police forces out there fighting the illicit trafficking in cultural property, cultural heritage. And to give you an example of how big such operations are, police operations, but also the clandestine um, trade they are fighting, is one of those operations, Operation Athena 2, which was conducted in fall 2019 by the World Customs Organization and Interpol, together with a, a, a kind of sub-operation Pandora 4 um, by the Guarda Civil in Spain and Europol. And in this operation alone, 19,000 archaeological artifacts and objects of art were seized. In 103 countries, 101 suspects were arrested and there were 300 inquiries. This is a huge operation and it is only one of many operations. So to give you an idea of how important this topic of fighting illicit trade and illicit excavation in cultural heritage and archaeological items is. Talking about illicit excavations, what's the main problem with illicit excavations? You don't know what was excavated. So you don't have a picture of what came out of the earth. You don't know what you're looking for when fighting illicit trafficking of cultural heritage. Here on this picture, you see a part of an archaeological site uh, of a site of Upper Maya in Syria taken in 2016. And what you see here on the screen on your left hand side is a uh, Greco-Roman temple with a columned street leading to it. This is how it looked before civil war started in Syria, and this is how it looked during civil war. And what you see on the right hand side now, what looks like pockmarks on a kind of moon-like, moon moonish surface, that's holes dug for illicit excavation. And these are not small holes, they are really big holes dug with heavy machinery. You see them from satellite imagery. And we don't know what came out of those looting holes. 
a lot of historical archaeological content, a lot of history for sure was destroyed with these illicit excavations. But we don't know what came out of the holes of the illicit um, dark holes. Nothing, stone statues, gold coins. We don't know what to look for. And that's a huge problem we have with illicit excavations um, in addition to the illicit trade in cultural heritage. Interpol um, published a survey uh, done within Interpol member countries, um, which assessed crimes against cultural property in 2021. Um, for that uh, survey, they had 74 participating countries in the questionnaire, as you see on the screen now, the main part coming from Europe, but also from the Americas, Africa and Asia and the South Pacific. And what they list for 2021 is a total number of 22,927 stolen objects. And we have here um, the different regions, Asia and South Pacific. There was the 40% that were stolen were library items. When we come to Europe, um, it was 53% numismatics that were stolen. Uh, from all the items. And as before mentioned, they, they investigated and list uh, paintings, sculptures, graphics, artistic craft, numismatic items, library materials, archaeological items, religious items, paleological items, and everything else that doesn't fall into those categories. And we have the same for, for Africa, with a lot of numismatic theft in 2021, and the Americas. And they also investigate the locations of crimes, where the crimes took place. We have religious buildings, private homes, paleontological sites, cemeteries, art galleries, antique shops, museums, archaeological sites, keeping in mind the clandestine illicit excavations, and others. And you see there's also a very mixed a, a potpourri of where those things are stolen. For example, in Europe, 14% out of private homes. Talking about Africa, cemeteries go to a number of 25%. In the Americas, it's museums, and paleological sites, cemeteries as well, art galleries. So it's really, really mixed. So basically, cultural heritage is stolen from everywhere. And we can state that nothing is really safe and that it's best to prepare once again for everything that can happen. We've talked about illicit excavations, why this is also so important. And here you have the report on illicit excavation, illicit excavated sites from 2019 in blue, grayish, from 2020 in yellow, and from 2021 in red. And you see that there is a rise and fall within those numbers. That especially in Asia and the South Pacific, this was a huge problem in 2020 and 2021. A high number of sites that were reported. We are talking only about reported sites here. And the same goes for attacks on cultural heritage that were reported in 2019, in 2020, in 2021. And we have to, to make sure to note that uh, data from 2021 does not include data from conflict zones. We already had certain conflicts uh, worldwide in these years, and they are not reflected in these graphs. We've already briefly touched upon the size of illicit trade in cultural heritage of organizations standing behind there. You remember Operation Athena 2. And Interpol also assessed the main smuggle routes when it comes to illicit trade of cultural heritage. And you see that on the one hand side, we have uh, trade within the continents, but the most um, obvious and clashing thing on this graph now is the worldwide trade, the cultural heritage that was looted or stolen um, in certain countries and uh, continents is trafficked all over the world. 
sometimes stored for decades to come. And then when the world is no longer looking at a certain conflict, at a certain area, um, then they reappear and are sold um, more or less openly uh, or on the black market to make sure that there's no immediate connection to the looting, to the stealing, to the theft, to the robbery. And this is something that we definitely have to keep in mind. Um, illicit excavations, uh, stealing, theft, robbery, looting of cultural heritage and illicit trade per se. But we also should keep in mind that if we have a situation that is instable, be it an armed conflict or be it a natural catastrophe, illicit trade of cultural heritage is something that is likely to happen as a add-on to the already catastrophic situation per se. So this is something that we definitely need to take away with us and keep in mind when we talk about risks for cultural heritage and preparedness in cultural heritage protection.